You may be seated. Grace and peace be unto you through God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the promise of baptism, and this very word you've heard, that I declare to you, God is pleased with you, not on account of what you have done or what you have left undone, For those things have only served to separate you from God. But on account of his son, Jesus Christ now, in Christ you have died. In Christ your sins are taken. In Christ you are given a new life, pure and beautiful life. Amen. When I was a seminary student at Luther Seminary, we took a course in the theory and the practice, the method of education. One of the assignments for this class was to prepare a display board advertising a special ministry. It could be a ministry that we were presently involved in as students, or it could be one we thought of. And then in class, we would have a a class fair of sorts, and we would all display our display boards and go around with pieces of paper and judge them and say what's good about them and what's not so good about them. I decided to make an advertisement for a ministry that I recalled from my home congregation, First Lutheran in Fargo. It was called Guardian Angels. And it was a ministry in which upper elementary kids would be matched up with a child who was to be baptized. And they would go up with the family during the baptism. They would hold the baptismal candle kind of as a sponsor. And they would promise to pray for the child being baptized. It was a cool way to get multiple generations involved in caring for those who the congregation baptized. To represent this ministry for my class project, I chose some construction paper. I got various shades of blue paper, made a nice big droplet of water, put some silver marker on it, thought it was really nice, very uh, catching to the eye. And then along with that, I made a Holy Spirit, uh, a dove, descending. But it wasn't just a white dove. I, it was orange and red and yellow. I put flames on the dove. I kind of hot-rotted this dove coming down about 100 miles an hour right into the baptism, which is how I imagined it, having heard this scripture uh, from Luke and from Matthew, this story of Jesus' baptisms a few, time, few times. It was fetching, I thought. It was eye-catching. This will get their attention. And I was very proud of it. So I brought my trifold with the droplet of water on the one side and the flaming Holy Spirit on the other. And people came around and made notes. And I went around and made notes of the other projects. And by the end of the day, I looked at the notes that had been made, expecting great accolades for my uh, beautiful artwork, only to find that there were more than a few classmates of mine who were a little put off by this. What does fire have to do with the Holy Spirit? Or with baptism, they asked me. Uh, And it was a little maybe too graphic. We don't understand, some of them said. Uh, Fire and kids don't mix, some of them said. So I learned a few lessons that day about uh, context. But John the Baptist does not lie. Jesus' baptism is more than just water, though we obviously use water. It is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, And with fire, John says. But what in the world does that mean? My classmates wondered, and maybe you do too. Because fire is dangerous, isn't it? It's no coincidence that we have many beautiful fire stations around our community. Grown men and women waiting at a moment's notice to go out and put out fires because they can do lots of damage. They are hot. They can burn you. It only takes usually one time to put your finger close to the flame to figure out you don't want to do that again. But fire also has a useful side. It is the source for all of our electricity and heat, even the heat we're enjoying in this sanctuary this morning. Fire also is used to purify things. In Jesus' day and in ours, you can purify metals with fire. Now, it's one thing to have a piece of gold or silver And clean it up on the outside. You can take water. You can take polishing. uh, 
material and clean that up really well. Make it shine on the outside. But how do you clean the impurities that are on the inside of a, of a piece of metal? Well, that can only be done with fire. When the temperature gets hot enough, the metal melts. The impurities rise to the top. They burn off. And fire makes them pure. So it is with the baptism of Jesus, as John tells us. And while this might sound a little crazy, even a little unsafe, I assure you that this is our greatest comfort in the power of baptism. For John came with his baptism. He said it was one of water only. It was for you to recognize your sin, the things you had not done well enough, or the things you shouldn't be doing, and then try your best to improve. Such a baptism we might describe in our parlance as pulling yourself up by your bootstraps in a moral way, or we would say you got to get her done, or maybe you have to love your neighbors more, or work for more justice in the world. Now these things are helpful in the world, in fact commanded of us, but they do not purify or forgive sin. John's baptism had value in this world, but it did nothing to make one right or even to ease the conscience. John knew this, however. John knew this. His job was to prepare the way for the one who would come to do something more powerful, not just whitewash the outside of your life, which is what he accused the Pharisees and the scribes of doing in order to look good for the neighbors. But John was preparing the way for the one who would make you 100% good, pure, and righteous. And this happened through Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus' baptism actually takes away your sins. Makes you right through and through, all the way through, not just on the outside. But how does he do this? Well, there is mystery here, as there is mystery in every baptism that we witness. But Paul makes a description in Romans, and here we get a little more of our small catechism teaching on baptism. Paul writes, did you not know that you who have been baptized have been baptized with Christ into his death? That is how your sins have been taken away. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, you too will walk in newness of life, death and new life, the Holy Spirit and fire. That is the promise of Jesus' baptism. Not just the appearance or shell of goodness. We spend enough of our lives working for that as it is, don't we? But we never make it. However, now Christ is given you perfect purity and peace. His purity and his peace. But what does this look like in everyday life? You might wonder. Well, if you like political drama... This may be your year. If you really like political drama, probably every year is your year because it doesn't seem that hard to find if you're looking for it. But seriously, when you take a look at the last few weeks as an example, you may have said to yourself one of three or more thoughts. Perhaps you said to yourself, what's so complicated about better protection? We need a wall. Why can't those folks in D.C. just get it together, do the work of government, compromise, and make it happen? Or maybe you were thinking something else, like just to reopen the government, for goodness sakes. People need paychecks, which is true, and people need the services that the government provides. You maybe th have been thinking that as well. Or maybe you've been thinking walls are not the solution. We need to love our neighbors to the south better and open our gates, not make more walls to keep them out. And who would be right? Don't answer that. All of these viewpoints, actually, all of them have a slice, a piece of righteousness in them. They are all seeking to love the neighbor better, one way or another, not necessarily all the same way. But none of them and none of the other opinions that we may have on this or many other subjects will allow us to perfectly love our neighbors. And none of these viewpoints make you righteous. 
The temptation, however, in politics and in pretty much every other area of our lives is to make what we think and believe our identity, to make that our righteousness. It's very easy to do. And we do it not just with thoughts and beliefs, but possessions and relationships. And that's part of the reason why politics gets so impassioned and challenging. It's why the word gridlock seems to go along with politics often. Now our system of government is not perfect. Sometimes it's easy to make fun of even. But it's about the best we have in the world and we should try to do it as well as we can. However, the way of politics often boils down to appearances, doesn't it? What's the polling data? What will this look like to the public? Politics is at best like a baptism of water, like John's baptism, but it is not our peace. When it works, it is an imperfect cleaning. It is an imperfect preservation of life. And we need this, actually, in this world. But it cannot create new life. True peace. True life. Deep righteousness that goes beyond just what people see. That is the stuff that can only come through the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The one who takes the old away and gives you new life. The one who forgives your sins. When we put our kids to bed each night, we give them a blessing. And sometimes we give them an absolution of their sins. We say God forgives them through Christ. And so do we. And our kids hear this and they know that God washes their sin away. But sometimes they poke and prod a little bit at this absolution and wonder what is the boundary of it? How far does it actually go? So the other night, Rafe, after hearing this absolution from me, said, yes, but does that mean that everyone forgives me? <laughs> He's poking and prodding. He's wondering what the polling data is. But what does everyone else think? It pains me a little that he's worried about this at five years old. But he has a beautiful promise in Christ. And we have a beautiful promise to share with him. And so I said, God's promise is that you are forgiven. And so it is. God said to Jesus, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Because of that, God now says to Rafe. And God now says to you. You are my beloved child. You are forgiven. All of the false hopes that you have for progress in this world are forgiven. But because of Christ alone, I am well pleased with you. Amen.